So I was a Christian Zionist. This is part two because I felt like uh, this subject is too uh, too big, too broad, even in the context of my personal testimony for me to cover in one sitting. So this is part two. Um, I was a Christian Zionist, and I began part one by quoting from Puck in A Midsummer Night's Dream, and I'll do it again. The heresies that men do leave are hated most by them they did deceive. And I'm one of them. So you can watch um, this part two, no problem. Watch it if you haven't watched part one. But do at some point go back. I encourage you, if you uh, got anything out of this, uh, and watch part one. So what I want to talk about now, a few weeks after I recorded part one, is my interaction with Jews in Southern California um, after I got kicked out of the United States Marine Corps, which I talked about in part one, but with an honorably classed entry-level discharge. And I began volunteering within a, a year, 18 months so, of getting kicked out, I think within the next two years. Anyway, I began volunteering with survivors of the abortion holocaust and taking images of aborted babies to high schools and to universities all around Southern California and the United States, but mostly all the universities and colleges in California. I'm talking about hundreds of schools and many, many, many high schools, public and private. The private, we wouldn't, you know, we would just go around the, per and even in the public, we would just go around the perimeter on the public sidewalks without blocking anyone. And we got arrested a lot, but we won the vast majority of those cases under the Bain Act in California. But when I was in the heavily Jewish areas of Southern California, uh, and again, at this time, I still probably would have classed myself, even though I was beginning to have doubts, as a Christian Zionist. Um, some, especially like Venice Beach, uh, when I was in the Hollywood area, many of these um, Hollywood let me avoid using the J word, but many of these chosen people would object to the fact that many of our signs made the Holocaust analogy, which anti-abortion pro-lifers have been making for many years. And one sign in particular we had that showed a, a baby that was killed uh, by abortion in the second trimester, baby Malachi, uh, a graphic photo of this baby, juxtaposed next to bodies stacked up on top of one another in the um, uh, Holocaust uh, images from uh, after World War II, from World War II, from Germany, from the concentration camps. And so at the top, it, it would say Hitler's Holocaust and show those bodies. And underneath, it would show baby Malachi and say America's Holocaust. And very often uh, in those areas, Jews would, would come up to us and object to the use of the term Holocaust, which is a term that, of course, in high school I saw the, uh, the images of um, Holocaust uh, you know, bodies being stacked up that's shown to most uh, American high school students. And so I'd, I'd always just basically believed the official narrative about the Holocaust of six million. And so I thought the analogy was valid. And so I would try to argue with them about that, and they would deeply, deeply, deeply object to the um, analogy. And I began to realize, you know what, the analogy is not only valid, but in ter terms of just the, the body count, the uh, babies killed by abortion are, are many, many, many times more than even the 6 million figure. I think we're up to the 45 pushing 50 million now in the year. Today's January 1st of uh, 2019. So um, it's, it's many times more even than their official 6 million Holocaust figure. But that launched me into a thought process that has continued from, from that time, you know, around 2003 up to 15 years later, almost 16 years later now in uh, the first day of 2019, today. And it led me to realize, first of all, how deeply pro-abortion many influential sections of the Jewish community are. There's even an online uh, article up by the Jewish Journal called The Curious Consensus of Jews on Abortion. It's one of those few issues, according to the article, 
And according to my experience, it's one of the few issues, even though Jews may be Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal on different um, particular issues around the world, it's one of the few that there really is a general consensus. Obviously, there's uh, Hasids and Orthodox who are anti-abortion, um, but they're generally speaking, in terms of uh, worldwide Jewry, there's there's quite a consensus on being uh, pro-choice or pro uh, abortion or whatever um, word they use to describe it. There, you know, Israel is an example. The policy of the Israeli government, uh, if you count the people in the womb as human beings made in the image of God, then uh, it's a statistical fact by the statistics reported by the Israeli government's own official websites. Go look them up if you don't believe me. It's at the Jewish Virtual Library and it's also at the official Israeli statistics. They've, it's something like 20,000 a year since the year abortion was uh, legalized as decades ago. And so they've, they've killed, I think it's upwards of, in the, in the ballpark of half a million by their own statistics, uh, baby Jews through abortion, which would make them, you know, I mean, that's many times, many times more than any Arab enemy, any Palestinian suicide bombers, any rockets from Gaza or any wars from Arab countries. I mean, it doesn't even come close. In other words, what I'm saying is that if the if the preborn Jews in the state of Israel alone, who have been aborted, many of them paid for by Israeli taxpayer dollars using their socialized medicine program, if they are counted, then literally, literally the Israeli state is the... Uh, actor which has killed more Jews, even if you believe the six million figure of the Holocaust, they've killed more Jews than any other uh, actor since the end of World War II, which I think I alluded to in part one of this. But that's a statistical fact by their own statistics, if you count those pre-born Israeli uh, babies as Jews that have been killed by the state of Israel in many cases paid for, as I said, by the Israeli tax money. But I digress. I would quarrel with these Jews about uh, whether or not it was bad for us to use the word Holocaust to refer to the, the death of babies in the United States of America by legalized abortion, and they were offended by it. And it made me think, as I said, number one, wow, this ethnicity really has a lot of people who are pro-abortion. But of course, I was in Southern California. What do you expect? But then as I, as I protested abortion more around the country, around the Midwest, in Ohio, in Missouri, in Kansas, I started to realize, yeah, there were Hindu abortionists, there's, there's uh, Gentile abortionists, but wow, there are a lot of Jewish abortionists in the USA. And a lot of Jews involved in the abortion industry, which is sad, very sad. I'm not rejoicing at that, but a, a lot of them, a lot of them. And I started to not only uh, notice that pattern, the disproportionate involvement of Jews in the abortion industry in the United States, which is where I'm from, and I noticed also and began to think about critically, what is the meaning of this word Holocaust? And I knew because I, even at that time I was pretty familiar with the Old Testament. I learned to read from the King James Bible. Um, I'd been reading the Bible my whole life. I've read it a lot more since then. Uh, I'm 39 years old now. I was in my early 20s at that time, but I've read it a lot more. But I knew, even then, that Holocaust was a biblical word from the Hebrew Bible, from the Torah, uh, where God, and you can look it up yourself, God commanded Moses to make a particular kind of offering called a Holocaust offering. I think it was using a cow. But a holocaust is an acceptable burnt offering unto God. And then it made me wonder, why would we call genocide, whether we're talking about abortion or the Armenian holocaust or the holocaust of Jews, why would we call it a holocaust? If a holocaust is an acceptable burnt offering for God, why would God require a human sacrifice? Why would a genocide uh, certainly God in the, never required Moses. Uh, the only time when God asked for a human sacrifice was with Abraham 
and Isaac, and God did not allow Isaac to do it. And as Christians, we know that is prefigured and was fulfilled in the one human sacrifice for all time, which is the sacrifice of the God-man. Of course, the the non-Messianic uh, Jews don't accept this, but the God-man, Jesus Christ, Yeshua himself, the one human sacrifice, one time for all sins in the person of Christ on the cross. So, aside from that, God has been the enemy of human sacrifice. It was Baal, uh, Baal, it was um, uh, Moloch, it was the false gods of the Canaanites, the Philistines, the heathen, which required human sacrifice. Even in rare instances among the Greeks, although their gods did not routinely uh, require human sacrifice, but you even see in the Iliad that uh, Poseidon required the uh, human sacrifice of Iphigenia uh, in order for, to pacify the seas so that uh, the, um, the Greek forces could proceed to attack Troy. What I'm driving at is that Yahweh, Jehovah, yod heid vad heid the Lord God of Israel, never, the great I Am never required, with the one exception of his own son, which he sacrificed for us. He never required of his people human sacrifice. So why then are we calling a genocide? Lay aside for the moment what you think about the Holocaust revisionism or what the numbers really were. Just accept it's a genocide. Armenian Holocaust, American Holocaust, Jewish Holocaust, the Holocaust. Why would we call a genocide of human beings, a holocaust. What God would accept such a sacrifice? Why would we use that term? I don't claim to have the answer to this now. I've heard it alluded to that it is a Kabbalist, like the six million figure, it is a Kabbalistic magical principle that they needed to sacrifice a certain number of Jews in order to pacify the Kabbalistic Talmudic God, which I would suggest, if that is true, is not Yahweh. May God forbid, this is a demon masquerading, a Talmudic demon masquerading as the God of the Bible, a false God, in fact, Satan himself, or some deputy of Satan's, I don't care who, someone who falls under the kingdom of Satan himself, who would require a human sacrifice, like the way they refer to the, their six million in World War II as a holocaust. Why would you call it an acceptable sacrifice from the biblical terminology of what was commanded to Moses? Because God never, can't be emphasized, can't be overemphasized, God never commanded Moses to sacrifice human beings. That was the distinctive of the God of Israel, was that he, he hated that. And you read Levit Leviticus 18, which brings me to another point. Um, the Christian Zionists, uh, one of their big leaders is John Hagee. And Hagee goes around, and many other Christian Zionists go around with their own versions of it. But Hagee repeats in almost every one of his speeches, and very famously repeats, and has never taken it back, that God gave, he says, God gave the Israelites the child, the physical seed of Abraham uh, through, through Jacob, the, all the land between the Jordan and the Euphrates River, unconditionally. And he always uses that word unconditionally. But the son of a bitch is lying. He pretends he's a preacher, and shame on the people who listen to him, and shame on him, because they haven't even read the Bible, because Leviticus 18 makes it very clear. Read it yourself. I'll paraphrase. But Leviticus says, don't think, speaking to the children of Israel, don't think that I'm giving you the promised land, because you you were better people than the Canaanites. I'm giving you, oh, and by the way, when God initially promised it to them, it was 500 years before he led them into it. He promised it to Abraham, but he said, I'm not going to give it to you now, Abraham, because the deeds, the iniquity, specifically the iniquity of the Canaanites is not yet filled up. It's not yet full. So Abraham and his descendants waited 500 years for the fulfillment of that promise of possessing uh, the promised land, and they, and they and then they waited 40 years more because of their disobedience, failing to follow Joshua and Caleb 
uh, and the spies who said, let's go take the land. And instead they uh, followed the cowards and waited 40 more years. But I digress. God waited for the deeds of the Canaanites to be full, their iniquity to be full. And then Leviticus, he told them specifically, and he alludes to it in other parts of the Torah, not only Leviticus, that the Canaanites are being kicked out, not because you people are so great, you Hebrews. It's because of their deeds, specifically the, and then he lists them, specifically, it wasn't eating pork, it wasn't the special commandments which were commanded to the Jewish people, and people get confused on this. There's special commandments which are commanded to individuals, special commandments which were commanded to the Jewish people, and then there's general moral law that God holds all human beings accountable for, which is, and this is some of it, the deeds of the Canaanites specifically sexual immorality. Not just, you know, a boy slept with a girl and they weren't married. You can fix that. They get married, right? But but the normalization of sexual abomination, especially sodomy, especially bestiality. But sodomy was right at the top of that list. And also the sacrificing of your sons and daughters. Human sacrifice, infant sacrifice unto idols, uh, unto idols, <laughs> idols, unto idols, I submit to you that Leviticus 18 and other passages of the Bible make it crystal clear. God says, the land vomited out and is vomiting out the Canaanites and I'm giving it to you because they did these things. Now, God says in Leviticus, don't do the deeds of the Canaanites. If you do these things like the Canaanites, if you do likewise, the land will likewise vomit you out, which proves... Uh, John Hagee and the Christian Zionists, for the damned liars they are, saying that God gave them the land unconditionally, you demonic, satanic liars, you know better. Deceivers, they know better. God gave them conditions. There were always conditions for possessing that land. And they violated those conditions. And in reality, uh, right now, in the Middle East, Israel is literally the only state in the Middle East, uh, Palestine under British rule, Palestine now under the rule of the Palestinian Authority, uh, have laws against abortion. Uh, they don't allow abortion. They don't allow um, sodomy. And it, it, in any other state in the Middle East, other than the so-called state of Israel, the Zionist state. So literally the very deeds, even though they're claiming the land uh, because God gave it to Moses and they've got some kind of a divine right, literally the very deeds, it's not obscure, it's not hard to read. People are lazy. People don't read their Bibles. So literally this state has literally legalized the very things that God told Moses would cause the land, the conditions that would cause the land to vomit them out and that would nullify their possession of the land. So even if the Old Testament covenant was still uh, in effect, and never mind the fact, and we'll get to this in a moment, that Jesus has nullified it anyway, but even if it was still in effect, they've already screwed up because they've violated the, the principal uh, conditions, even though these liars say it was given unconditionally, and the people who follow these liars are so lazy that they don't even bother to read the Bible and see that the conditions are laid out there in black and white, don't do the abominations the Canaanites did, which the state of Israel legalized. If you do, the land will vomit them out, will vomit you out, will vomit you out. So, uh, I repented of this Christian Zionism. Now, let me look at my notes here. Mm -hmm. Wanted to talk about Leviticus 18. We've been talking about this. Now, let's talk and, and the meaning of the Holocaust. It means a burnt offering. Well, genocides are not burnt offerings, okay? Not to God, not to the creator of heaven and earth. They may be uh, a twisted, wicked burnt offering to a false idol or to Satan, but not to the Lord God. So, any Kabbalistic God who requires a human sacrifice is a demon, is, is a Satan, is a false God, masquerading as the God of the Bible. Now, um, uh, th so those are two reasons to absolutely repudiate uh, Zionism in any of its forms. Uh, now, Matthew 23, read the whole thing. Go through it. Go through it. And I also recommend very heavily, it's not boring at all, read uh, Josephus' 
The Jewish War. It's available on audio, in Audible, in a very excellent uh, Audible uh, format. And it's available free online. It's available, I'm sure, in uh, soft and hardcover formats if you want to buy it. Read it. It's riveting. It's riveting. You'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot. Among the things you'll learn is that the temple was raised to its very foundations. And so this uh, thing they've been passing off for the past you know, few decades as their um, wailing wall, the temple wall, it's not. It's, it's a wall that Herod built for the Romans. Probably the, uh, the fortress of, uh, that he dedicated to Mark Anthony. So it's a big lie. They're, they're, they're laughing at Christians because Jesus said in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very clearly, he says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, not one stone will be left upon another. So that big, huge wailing wall is not the wall of their temple. They're lying. Jesus called them liars. They're lying. They're lying to you. Don't uh, play along with their lies. It's just a way of getting Christians to, to mock Jesus because they know, I think many of these Zionists know the New Testament, excuse me, more than the Christians themselves do, better Unfortunately, because the Christians are lazy, don't read their Bibles and let uh, fools and, and stupid false teachers like Hagee and the other Christian Zionist teachers digest the word for them, and they don't even check it against their Bibles. So it's very shameful, very shameful. And because of that, they allow um, the Zionists to make a masquerade as Christians go put their prayers in this wall, and it's nothing but a Roman fortress. It's not the wall of the temple. If that's the wall of the temple... Then Jesus was lying in Matthew, Mark, and Luke when he said, I tell you, truly, not one stone will be left upon another. Well, the eyewitnesses of what happened in AD 70, which Josephus records very, very uh, clearly in the Jewish war. Again, pick it up, read it. Uh, the eyewitnesses, both Roman and Josephus himself, who was a Jewish leader, Okay? An eyewitness. They say very clearly that the Romans dug up the foundations of the temple. They didn't leave anything standing to encourage uh, further rebellions. They did not. So, it's a big deception. Now, to go from there, uh -huh, the meaning of Holocaust. Oh, read not only the, the Jewish War by Josephus, but Matthew 23, from beginning to end. But I want to talk about the end. The end of Matthew 23, if I can say it, at the end of Matthew 23, Jesus says, you will not see my face again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, as we interpret this in the context of Matthew 23, this is basically Jesus giving his certificate of divorce to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the scribes. And you can read it all there. I think he's speaking prophetically in a lot of it. He's alluding to what happened, you know, almost 40 years later in AD 70, when the Romans under Vespasian and Titus sack Jerusalem, the great suffering. He weeps over it, but he gives his certificate of divorce and his uh, terms of reconciliation. And that's how the chapter ends. And the terms are, you will not see my face again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, obviously, they saw his face. He's not talking about these particular individuals are not going to see the way his nose looks or the color of his eyes or the color of his beard or the way, you know, they'll see his physical face again after Matthew 23. That's not what he's talking about. I submit to you that the, big, the blessing that Moses would give his people if you recall, those of you who have read the Bible, a lot of what I'm saying is not going to make sense to anyone who, who hasn't read the Bible. So if you haven't, you know, you need to read the Bible, okay? Whether you think you're a Christian or a Jew or whatever you, or nothing, if you want to understand these things, you've got to read the Bible. But Moses would bless the people in the Torah and say, and part of the big part of the blessing was that God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And uh, many Christian pastors um, also use that blessing in church. But that was the blessing that Moses commanded and that Moses gave the people, that the Lord would make his face to shine upon you. Well, in claiming to be the I Am, 
which is why the Pharisees want to, wanted to kill him, because he said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus was claiming to be the one that Moses was talking about when he said, the Lord make his face shine upon you. And in Matthew 23, so he's not saying you won't see my physical characteristics after today. What he's saying is that after this divorce, okay, you're not, my face is not going to favor you. My favor is not going to, I'm not going to turn my face to shine upon you as you ask for in that prayer that Moses gave you ever again until you bless me as Messiah, okay? Until you bless me as Messiah, which gives the lie to the Zionists, including the Christian Zionists, who say that uh, it's Jesus, that it's God, that it's Yahweh, that it's the Father, helping them establish the state of Israel and win the Six-Day War and defeat their Arab enemies and defeat the Palestinians and get their nuclear weapons and behind Zionism and all that. Well, if that was true, then God would be a liar. No, let God be true and Christian Zionists be liars. Let God be true and the Israelis be liars. Let God be true and men be liars. You're the liars. <laughs> God is true. God has not blessed them. Now, God is sovereign over everything. So they couldn't have won a war if ultimately in his sovereignty, God wouldn't allow them to win a war. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that God wanted them not to win the war in a sovereign sense. Everything in a sovereign sense, according to the sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God, is, is ruled over by him. But there's a special way in which God favors people by turning his face on them. And it's impossible. It's impossible that people who uh, continue to say that Jesus was a liar, the son of a prostitute, uh, not the Messiah, refuse to bless him as the one who came in the name of the Lord would be favored of him. That would be a uh, schizophrenic, uh, a, a multiple personality, double-minded man, and that is not Jesus Christ. And that is not the great I am. So, Satan has led them into a trap. Now, another thing you'll see, if you study, people don't study, but if you study Jewish history, including the founding, up to and including the founding of the state of Israel and Zionist history, but Jewish history throughout uh, the world. By the way, read, read uh, the, um, the Martin Luther's uh, The Jews and Their Lies. Let me grab a copy of it for you. Be right back. If I can pause this. Okay, I got it. Um, got it in plastic here to keep my dirty hands off of it. I don't know if it's um, reversing the image or not, but it's in the Missouri Senate has hidden because they're embarrassed of this uh, treatise that Martin Luther wrote toward the end of his life. And by the way, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I'm not currently a member of the Missouri Senate Lutheran Church. In fact, I never have been. My brother is. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, this is a, a, a treatise that is worth uh, reading, and it has been hidden by the Missouri Synod in Luther's works. You can order it online if you want to. Luther's works, The Christian in Society, Volume 4. And it's sandwiched in between two other, um, two other um, writings between uh, Luther's warning to the German people against the Sabbatarians, against the Antinomians, and then on page 121, on the Jews and their lies, with a huge apologetic introduction uh, by a missouri Synod writer who's very, obviously very embarrassed and, and spends like 20 pages trying to apologize for it. Nonetheless, read it. Luther talks a lot about uh, different messiahs that the Jews followed over the years. Not only the ones that Josephus talks about, again, in Josephus, who was not a Christian, but a uh, faithful historian, obviously, you know, sucking up to the Roman authorities, but still uh, a very worthwhile historian. So, again, read uh, on the Jews and their lies. It's also available online. It's on YouTube. You can get it, uh, listen to it, or read it. It's worth reading. Um, but Josephus also records, oh, as an eyewitness, over and over and over and over, that uh, as they were leading up to their rebellion against the Romans, uh, there were messiahs who came. There were people who came promising, you know, political and military solutions to their, uh, uh, that the, um, the, the zealots uh, 
wanted to the Roman rule, thinking that Yahweh, thinking that Jehovah God was going to side with them to send a new Joshua, to send a military Messiah who would give them power to overthrow the Romans and set up the carnal kingdom that they wanted. And, you know, they were slaughtered. They ate their own children. Josephus talks about that too, okay? So, so the people who love them, the people who really love them, won't encourage them to keep trying this. Because every time, Luther talks about it, every time throughout history, from 70 AD forward, that they try, and Josephus got up on the wall. You see, he got up on the wall and begged them to surrender. They wouldn't. And he, one of his arguments was that, you know what? If God wants to deliver you, he'll do it like he did in Egypt, by miracles and by power, not by your rebellion and military might. So give it up. But they won't. They won't. That's why St. Paul said, wrath is come unto them unto the uttermost. What I'm saying is, these people who continue, these false messiahs, like Zionism, these false, uh, these antichrist-isms, these antichrist beliefs that lead them to take up arms, to try to carnally uh, and, and extra-biblically, and without Messiah, grab hold of the promises, it always ends in death and failure and misery for the Jews. So if you think I hate Jews, you're wrong. I love them. The Christian Zionists hate Jews, the people who encourage them with these false messiahs and military conquests, which always end in their miserable suffering, which always end in everything that they thought was going to work to their advantage, falling down around them. You're the people who hate them. You're the people who are working evil against them by encouraging them to place their hope in anything, anything other than the blood and body of Messiah the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Yahweh in the flesh, okay? You better hear me, because God is not going to hold you uh, Gentiles guiltless who didn't read your Bible, who believed, uh, you know, unless you're Down syndrome, unless you're so retarded, you can't, unless you're illiterate, even then, the Holy Spirit will show you, if you pay attention, listen to me, if you can't read. But most of you can read, and you're just too mm, lazy, and full of yourselves to even read the Bible and see how, how foolish you've been and how carnal you've been and how you're collaborating with these people, leading them to their own destruction. Well, it'll fall on you too, in this life and or the life to come. And you'll forfeit Christ. You'll forfeit Christ because you, you made the gospel, which was your duty to bring to them, to the Jew first and then the Gentile, you made it subject to your eschatological scatological, <laughs> that's the study of shit, but let me say not scatological, scatological, eschatological, in times, fantasies. Okay, brother, okay, sister, repent of leading the Jews astray. Repent of collaborating with them in their antichrists. Repent of this great delusion. Let me go on from there. I think I've said enough about that. Uh, I want to give you examples biblically. I'm not going to give you all the references. Again, if you people are too uh, lazy to look this up, uh, there, you know, that's on you. Um, all the, you know, the internet is available. Your Bible is right there. If you don't have a Bible with references, go buy one. But stay away from the Schofield reference Bible. That thing, sometimes you see two verses on top, and then Schofield's words take up like 80% of the page. He's a liar. It's because he can't, you know, the things that he's teaching don't actually come from the Bible. It's, he's a false teacher. Uh, I, I dare say uh, the Schofield Reference Bible is as much of a, a false spin on the Word of God as the Book of Mormon or the Talmud or the Koran. Okay? It's just another Antichrist. Another um, satanic deception. Now, there's a time when, in the in the uh, Book of Kings, when Pharaoh sided with the people, uh, the king of Israel, when they were in a state of rebellion, and Pharaoh was defeated. What's my point? Just because you side with the physical seed of Abraham or of Israel, doesn't guarantee that God's going to bless you. The blessing is through the covenant. The blessing is through obedience. Okay. God said, I will have mercy and not sa obedience is better than sacrifice. So, so just citing, being a Gentile and siding with the seed of Abraham, you know, 
can get your butt killed, all right? It happened to Pharaoh because God doesn't always side with the physical seed of Abraham. In fact, when they're in a state of rebellion against him and idolatry, you know, that's actually uh, you uh, destroying yourself by siding with them. And it happened to Pharaoh at one point. Again, the sons of Eli. When you read about the sons of Eli, before the time of Samuel, uh, Eli was the priest, and God took the priesthood away from the, the lineage of Eli. Um, but Eli was the one who trained little Samuel with his little ephod after his mother uh, gave him to the temple according to her prayer and promise. My point is the sons of Eli, they were sons of Belial. They were sleeping with whores. They were eating the nice uh, portion of the Lord's sacrifice. They were no good. Okay, but they thought, but they were, they were, uh, you know, Israelites. So, so the, the Christian Zionists say, well, you've got to bless uh, the, the seed of Abraham. And, and if you bless them, God will bless you. Well, it didn't work out for the sons of Eli. Uh, they even had the Ark of the Covenant itself. But they were in a state of rebellion and disobedience. And they were profaning God's covenant. So it didn't help them being Jews or Israelites. It didn't help them at all. In fact, it worked against them. They were slain. Eli fell off his stool, if you'll recall, and hurt himself. And they were slain. And the ark was captured by the Philistines because God was making a point. It's not the physical lineage. It's not the physical ark. It's the covenant. It's the obedience. So there's no benefit, <laughs> no benefit to uh, siding with the physical, even the very sons of the priest themselves who serve in the temple if they're in a state of disobedience. Okay? So that shoots that down. Again, uh, Josephus in A Jewish War records there were many signs, many signs given to them. But then people would come, I mean signs, that they should not rebel. And you can read them. One of them was that the, um, the priests were serving in the temple and they heard the sound of a great host rushing through and saying, let's depart from this place. Okay, Several witnesses heard it, according to Josephus. And it was the angels of the Lord, the hosts of the Lord, removing their protection. So Satan has set these people up. They're trusting in their nuclear weapons. We're talking about the Israelis now, the Christian Zionists. They're trusting in their money, their nuclear weapons. They think God's just going to side with them because they don't have foreskins, because they're, you know, you know the seed of... Abraham, it's questionable whether the uh, Ashkenazis even are Semitic peoples. The Palestinians are Semitic peoples. The Arabs are Semitic peoples. But even if the Ashkenazis are, you know, everybody's probably got a drop of uh, Semitic blood in them, you know, this far in the future. That's how it works. Uh, genealogies. But, you know, it's hard to, you know, once you get hundreds of years into things, uh, we've probably all got some Semitic, you know, many people have some Semitic blood in them. But the point is, that's not what God looks at. It's obedience. Now, our hope as Christians is that a remnant of Jewish people, a remnant of physical Israel, we are promised, will be saved in the end. But this Israeli secular state killing their babies through abortion, uh, legalizing sodomy, whole, uh, which Revelation calls the city of Jerusalem, Sodom and Gomorrah where also our Lord was crucified. That's what John the Revelator calls the city of Jerusalem. And the Israeli state is, is holding official sodomite pride parades in the holy city of Jerusalem. <laughs> and you want to say this is the, the favored people of God? Shame on you. Shame on you. Repent. And, and if you're a Christian, the gospel must come first. And don't encourage these confused Jews and Zionists, in the, any more than you would uh, encourage a communist Jew in his communism. Just because a Jew is, is, is behind it, doesn't make it good. <laughs> Instead, give them the gospel. Resist their lies. Uh, separate yourselves from any collaboration with them and their lies. As John Chrysostom warned you, okay, if you don't want to hear it from Martin Luther... John Chrysostom has a, uh, a treatise against the Jews. Read it. If you're a Catholic or an Orthodox Christian, as I am, read it. It's a saint of your uh, church who has taken 
great pains to write a treatise against the Jews. Read what John Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom, has to say against the Jews. And I'll leave you with that. I was once a Christian Zionist. I have regressed. <laughs> this is my regression and my confession, part two. I was a Christian Zionist. So please forgive me for my Zionism. Lord, forgive me. And brothers and sisters, forgive me. And take this testimony as evidence of my repentance. You also should repent. Repent. <laughs>